and dwells deep within. The peace that he gives no can equal his love and You know, we all have this thing where we just we just rely on Rob, Rob to take care of us, right? We just rely on Rob to take care of us, and so when that doesn't happen, then you have to rely on me to take care of you, and this is what it looks like, right? <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to this gathering today at Bethel Baptist Church, and as we worship together, I'm getting to you. I'm getting to you. All right. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together as we uh, gather weekly for worship. Thank you for coming today. I hope that you are already blessed in some way and that we uh, continue to be blessed as we worship together. A couple of things I need you to know, I uh, need you to be thinking about. Um, we voted a week or so ago to... Uh, do some upgrades in, in the building, and uh, so we're going to be starting on some projects. Uh, we have a couple of dates that we, one date uh, that we, we, we need to set up. Uh, one of them is a date that we're also going to have uh, some help, I hope, from Redeemer Fellowship with some young legs. You guys are like this. We need some young legs as well because we're going we're gonna to be cleaning out the attic area and, and taking some stuff out of that because we need some of that space and so we're gonna allow the young legs for redeemer and any young legs that i see here uh, to help us carry some stuff from upstairs to downstairs so just know that that'll hopefully be before uh too long on a saturday morning we have to 
wait for it to, to not be smoking hot in the attic because if you've been in the attic when it's a hot day, you won't be for very long. So uh, just know that. So I want you to just be thinking about that and, and listening for that and uh, be willing to clear some time uh, on a, probably on a Saturday morning to help us uh, to clear some stuff out of the attic because we have to make room for uh, the, the air conditioning people when they're going to come in and, and do their work. Also, um, we, we need that, some of that same group of people. Uh, do you have a date on, on that yet? So we, we also, we have a line of trees on Hub Drive out here. It's about 25 trees strong that we need to trim them up. We need to kind of raise the canopy on them. Uh, and we're going to they're going to take that project on uh, ourselves, and so we need some, uh, some, some help moving uh, some brush after it comes down and, and loading it on trailers and, and hauling it. So uh, if you are interested in doing that, helping us with that, Ray Fanning is in the back of the building, and you'll see, you know who he is. Just go track him down, and he will plug you in. Uh, and let you know the date on that. So uh, that's for all of the trees out here on, on the west side of uh, our property line. We've got to raise the canopy on those. So we may also pick that same day to trim bushes. So Sandy, we may also take that day to trim bushes. So, um, and we've, mm-hmm. I know, I know, that's why I'm, that's why I'm saying it. That, that's why I'm saying it, so you can let him know that, okay? Um, this Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, September the 15th at, at 6.30, if you have been a small group Bible study leader uh, before we had to shut down uh, for COVID back in, in uh, March of 2020, uh, if you have been a small group leader, uh, and we're, we're going to have a meeting to, to put this all back together and move forward with, with small groups and Sunday school again starting in October. And so we, we want to have just a time where we sit down together and, and uh, give you some dates on that. So if you've been a small group leader or if you are interested in being a small group leader, Sunday school teacher, uh, or have been contacted to do that, uh, I need you to, to be here Wednesday night at 630. Uh, and we'll, we'll take probably 45 minutes to an hour and we'll go through and see what that looks like. We have some slots to fill. We have... Uh, some classes that we need some leadership in, and so we, we, we know that and we understand that. And so I need you to pray about that between now and Wednesday and then come at 6.30, okay? The last date you need to know about is October the 10th. That is the day we're going to have our fall festival here uh, at, at Bethel. Uh, we're going to do that after uh, the service uh, on, su on that Sunday morning. Uh, all of that may just tie in together, all right? If we get the, the right weather, we may have completely different look on that particular Sunday morning, so I'll be uh, excited about that. October the 10th will be that date, okay? So let me pray with you real quick as we, uh, this is not our family corporate prayer time, I just want to pray with us this morning uh, because it's always good to pray, all right? Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives and the ways that you bless us. And Father, as we look forward to, to doing some things in the building, we know that that's because you've blessed us uh, to be able to do that. And, and I, I just can't thank you enough for the ways that you've blessed us in the, the last few years financially and, and in so many ways. So we just uh, want to do things to, to, to glorify you uh, today and as we worship uh, today we, we thank you and we love you and we praise you and want to give you glory for how you're going to act and, and react and, and move today in this service. Thank you for Jesus. Let's sing. Full time religion. It was good. 
Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Make me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It will take us all to heaven. It will take us all to heaven. It will take us all to heaven. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. been faithful to you today. Have you considered that even yet this morning? How has the Lord God been faithful to you even this morning? We sing that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Oh, I pray that it's not just words on a screen.
but it's true in your heart today. How has the Lord been faithful to you this last week? Because Psalm 124 says this, if the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. The swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Verse 6 says this, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. The words say, all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, can you say this today? Unto me. Thank you for being faithful to me. The cool thing about that is every person in this room can say that at exactly the same time and it doesn't diminish the Lord's faithfulness one iota. To each one of you individually. How cool is that? Our God is such a great God. He can be faithful to everyone all at the same time. And nobody gets any less of his faithfulness. Do you believe that? Thank him this morning for his faithfulness as we pray together as a family. Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together as a family and, and pray before you, Lord, bring our petitions to you. Lord, as pastors remind us and as this song has reminded us and as your word reminds us of your faithfulness, Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for that faithfulness even when we're not faithful. Lord, teach us to rely upon you. Lord, help us to realize that you have provided everything that we need. Lord, help us to, to be thankful for that provisions. Lord, to be satisfied with that provision. Lord, teach us to just draw on your faithfulness every day, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the folks that are here. Thank you for what they mean to my family, Lord. I thank you for their friendship, and I thank you for their love and their support for each other, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for this time of, of singing, Lord, how that has just uplifted my, my heart this morning. Lord, just prepare our hearts as, as we begin to hear your word as pastor brings the message today that you've laid on his heart. Lord, just uh, open our hearts and our minds, just clear any distractions out of the way, Lord. Let us be focused upon you today. Lord, we thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ, for that provision that you made, sending him to die on the cross for our sins, to pay a price that we could not we could never pay. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your faithfulness through all generations for the faithfulness in the past and, and the faithfulness that we're going to experience tomorrow and the next day and the next week and the next years. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, 
I'd sing that chorus for you again, but I'm not going to. You deserve better. So I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning as we begin. I've already asked, in, in a way, one of them. <clears throat> I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be in probably one of the most familiar places of Scripture for the next three or four weeks. <clears throat> and I want you to begin to think about this question. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about God? It's a question that you might think is simple enough to answer. And there are probably some very easy words that you could just recite about what you believe about God. And they, they become, because they are characteristics of God that I'm sure would be included in the lists of your beliefs. I believe, and probably you do as well, that God is loving and kind and merciful, and forgiving, and sovereign, and all-knowing, and all-powerful, and mighty. He is the creator and the sustainer of all things. And there, are mu and there is so much, much more about what I believe about God. What do you believe about God? As we go through this passage of Scripture for the next three or four weeks, and it will take me longer than that, but for the next three or four weeks, this is the question for you to begin to answer in your head and in your heart. You can answer it in your head, but I need you to answer it in your heart. What do you believe about God? Because the second piece of that is this. Why do you believe it? I believe this about God, okay? I believe God is loving. Because he is, by very definition, love. He is. See, love is not just a characteristic of God. It is a characteristic of God, but it is not just a characteristic of God. You see, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 said, says this, not God loves, but God is love. He is by very definition love. It is his nature. I believe that God is is forgiving because I have experienced the peace that comes from his forgiveness because he is love and because he is love and by very definition love there could be no forgiveness. And so I believe God forgives because he loves, because he is love. You see, when we begin to stack blocks and, and on top of blocks, what happens is we solidify and we strengthen that which we believe. I don't just believe God loves. I believe God 
is love. And I don't just believe God forgives. I believe God forgives because he is love and for so many other reasons. I believe these things because I have experienced them and I read about them in his word. And when, I, when you read about something and you experience it, it strengthens both of them. It, 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 and so what we find is that, that we can strengthen our faith as we read and as we experience. But okay, so I believe God is loving and I believe that God is forgiving, right? Both of those things are very easy things to talk about, right? They make it very easy to talk about the gospel. As a disciple, one of my, one of my responsibilities is to talk about and share the gospel. So if we want to just talk about God being loving and God being forgiving as it relates to the gospel, man, that's easy. Sign me up, right? But I think there are some, there are some other things that I believe about God that are not so easy to talk about as it relates to the gospel because I believe that God is just. I believe that God gets angry. I believe that God is jealous. And he says that to us and to me. I am a jealous God. What is he jealous for? He is jealous for my heart. When I turn from him, he's jealous. And he does what he needs to do in my life to draw me back to him. So I also believe in God's forgiveness, but I believe that, see, I believe that God's forgiveness does not cancel sin's consequences or his discipline. You see, those are things that are not quite so easy to talk about as it relates to the gospel. But they are still true about God, and I believe them about God. There's another set of questions that believers, that the disciple, often are faced with that kind of demonstrate the need to know the why of what we believe. What do you believe about God? Can you formulate your list of what I believe about God? Because then I need you to answer the question, why do you believe it? Because there is a list of questions that not only do unbelievers have, but also believers have at times when they're in deep struggle or pain. Where is God, one of those questions might be, where is God and why do I feel like I'm facing this cancer all by myself? Where is God and why does God allow a child to be hurt? Why doesn't God intervene in a natural disaster? See, these are all questions that not only do non-believers have, that we sometimes just kind of punt because we don't necessarily have the answer for them right on the tip of our tongue, but I believe also that we have them as well in certain situations and in certain times of our life. They're hard questions. They're questions that can challenge our beliefs about God. And they're questions that it's okay to have if we're asking them with the right motive. So I ask you again, what do you believe about God? Stand with me if you will and let's read in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5, we read some of this last week, starting at verse 5. 
And then we'll focus in on our scripture for the day. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 5, Jesus says this, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think it will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. We're going to come back to that verse because that speaks much about one of the characteristics of God. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Verse 9, in this manner, now we're going to get to our focus for the next three weeks, or four weeks, or five weeks, or however long it takes me to get through this scripture. Verse 9, in this manner... Therefore, pray. Let's say this together. You ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So Father, I pray you would bless the reading of your word. God, you would solidify and strengthen our belief in you today through the words we read in this passage. Thank you for Jesus. You may be seated. The Lord's Prayer, commonly named section of scripture starting in verse 9 in this manner therefore pray our father who is in heaven who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Memorized, recited, quoted, all of those things. And as we look at this prayer, or as we look at this portion of scripture, I know it's very familiar, okay? It's very familiar to me as well. And as I was working through this next series of messages, it dawned on me that the question that I asked this morning, what do you believe about God, is right there in front of us in this prayer or in this template. So I want you to ask yourself this question. What might I learn about God In this passage, in the Lord's Prayer, what might I learn about God that will strengthen my own beliefs and convictions about God, as well as help me to answer those that come to me questioning God? What does Jesus say to us about God? that can strengthen and solidify your beliefs. I believe that it's very important in this time that we do that. 
But see, this prayer is not really the Lord's prayer. It's really the Lord's model for prayer. It's not that it's, it's not a prayer that we can pray, but really what this prayer is, it's kind of a skeleton. The words in this prayer are kind of a skeleton that we hang clothes on that kind of tell us what it is, that, that remind us how to pray. This is not a what to pray. This is a how to pray. When we think about prayer, we think about this um, acrostic that the ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, all that is doing is telling us as we pray, remember these things. Remember adoration. Give God God's due. God, I love you for who you are. Confession, we have to come to God with a clean heart. Thanksgiving, thanking him for all of the things that he's done for us. We're really good at the last piece, the supplication thing. God, give me, give me, give me. Right? We're really pretty good at that piece of it, but we forgot adoration, confession, and thanksgiving. We just jump right to supplication. We all do, your pastor included. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's giving us this kind of template for how to pray. And he begins with the place that we won't get past today. All right, he says, when you pray, pray like this. He says, our Father who art in heaven. Now the thing about praying this way for the Jewish audience that Jesus is addressing here is they didn't address God as their father. We find it very common to do that. We do this, that's how we are taught to pray. Pray to God as if he's your father. But see, in the Old Testament, we only find, you will only find 14 references in the entire Old Testament, which is in Jesus is talking about now the law and the prophets. That's the entirety of the Old Testament, the scripture that they had available to them at that time. I'm trying to breathe, Tracy. I'm trying to breathe. Fourteen times in the entire Old Testament will you find God as Father referenced. But it was not as dad it was as in it was really just in their relationship to Israel as a nation God is the father of Israel all of the people right in other words it's like God is the father of the Southern Baptist Convention you might be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention but God is the father of the Southern Baptist Convention doesn't really include me I can't address him that way we can as a denomination but I can't personally and that's what they thought so when God says to this group of people who have been raised in this Jewish culture of you don't address God as father and when he says to them, pray this way, our Father completely changed their thinking. You see, because in the New Testament, in Jesus' prayers, he always referred to God as his Father. First of all, he could, okay, we get that piece of it, right? He could, but that's not his point. His point is, so can you, and so can you, and so can you, and so can you. He always referred to God as Father in all of his prayers in the New Testament. Jesus did, except one. When he was on the cross in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. It's the only prayer that Jesus offered to God where he didn't say, Father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only prayer that Jesus offered in, his, in, in any of the Gospels that he did not refer to God as his Father. 
So he changed their thinking. He wants to change your thinking about who God is. What do you believe about God? He says he wants to be your father. He's saying pray how? When you pray, Jesus says, pray this way. Our father. Why does he want you to pray this way? Go back to verse 8. Verse 8 says, therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. What does that say about God? We use these words many times, that these, these big words that are, that are like scholarly words, and, and you know if I use them, it's not because it's scholarly, it's because I read it somewhere, Okay. Words like omniscient and omnipresent. Omniscient is the word that means all-knowing. God is, what this says, what verse 8 says to us about God is that he is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows before you ask what it is that you need of him but why and so what but what what that looks like is that he desires to hear from you more than you want to ask that's one of the things that i want you to believe about god that he desires to hear from you more than you want to ask. And you think you really want to ask bad. <sighs> Is what the Jews thought. Jesus says, pray to your father. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So I thought about that, and I said, well, here's kind of what that, the application of that often looks like. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Your father knows the things you have. Tell me the next word. Need of, before you ask him, right? We, I, often confuse Need with want. This is the application of verse number 8 in many believers' lives. I misinterpret need for want. Okay? What does Jesus say about God? He knows what you need before you ask him. So this is how we pray. We're going through this time where we feel all alone. And we say, God, where are you? And what is, and why won't you deliver me out of this situation? So we pray for deliverance or the easing of this burden, right? We pray for deliverance. That's what I want. I mean, man, I want out of this. This is hard. So we pray for deliverance. But, but God, see, God, Jesus says your father knows the things you have need of. So what is it that God knows that you need? I pray for deliverance. God knows that I need perseverance. That leads to perfection. Or the finishing of my faith. You see, so while we're praying for deliverance, God is saying, I'm just per perfecting you. I'm just taking you through to the end. See, it changed my perspective when I thought, began to think about things that way. When, when, when I'm going through something, it's like God is taking me to the end. The thing that I need is perseverance, right? Think about this. Romans chapter 5 starting in verse 3, says, and not only that, but we glory in tribulations. 
No, we don't. Who glories in tribulations? Knowing, here's the thing. What is it that I'm asking you? What do you know about God? What do you believe about God? We glory in tribulation knowing that the tribulation, the thing that God is allowing me not to be delivered from, produces perseverance, that which I need. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. You see, what, I really, what God really knows that I need is hope. But how am I going to get hope without character? And how am I going to get character without perseverance? And how am I going to get perseverance without tribulation? And we throw ourselves on the altar and we say, deliver me, deliver me, deliver me. And God says, I'm taking you through it. And I'm standing right here. Perfecting your faith. Maturing your faith. Strengthening your faith. So that you know who I am and how much I love you. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope. Now hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God, there it is, all the way back to that love thing. Has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. What do you believe about God? James says, count it all joy whenever you fall into various trials. Knowing that the trial does exactly what Paul just said. It finishes our faith. Joy is that settled assurance that all is right between me and God. So I'm not saying don't don't not pray for deliverance. What I'm saying is, what do I need, God? Thank you for walking with me through the trial. It hurts really bad. I'm confused. I don't know what's going on, but I know you do. And you're bringing me to maturity as a believer in in the trial. But there's a struggle as we think about God, our Father. Some of you will relate to this differently than others, but we all know something of this struggle. Do you see the struggle? Jesus says, when you pray, pray, our Father who art in heaven. And the only thing we can think about is my dad. And some of you were hurt by your dad. And some of you were abused by your dad. And some of you were neglected by your dad. Some of you had a great relationship with your dad. But what I believe about God is in large part determined by what I've experienced with my earthly father. Good or not so good. We cannot not carry that baggage. When I do marriage counseling with with couples, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is, what are you bringing into this marriage? What is your relationship with your father? What is your relationship with your mother? What is 
your, sp your spouse to be, your fiance's relationship with his, your father and your mother. You're bringing that into the marriage. You can't not. And so the struggle is understanding what this looks like. Because, because one of the things that, that Jesus, as he was talking with, with in, to his Jewish audiences as, and as the Gentiles in the surrounding uh, community, as, as they heard him speak and as the Gentiles heard the gospel under Paul, you see, one of the things that they had to deal with was their picture of their gods, you see, their picture of their gods were gods of, that were very vindictive. You see, the gods of the Gentiles, they had zero desire to interact with man. And so the Gentiles, their picture of God was this person or this being that I have to find a way to not, to, to not make him mad at me. I have to appease him. The, the things that I have to sacrifice are seriously bad stuff. I've got to sacrifice a child to this God in order to not make him mad at me. And all of that. So, so, so they had to overcome that as they were sharing the gospel in the Gentile world. What I want you to know, what I want you to understand about your Father in heaven is is he is not your father on earth. Even those of you who had a great relationship with your earthly father, I let my children down. I failed them. Often. Hopefully at my funeral they won't remember all of those times. They'll remember some of the times when I didn't let them down. But I did. And I know that. The thing about our Father in Heaven is He never did or does or will. That's what I want you to believe about God. We have this reconciliation piece, even as, as we see that. And so if, if you didn't have a, relation, a good relationship with your father, your earthly father, the, the hurt and the pain, I don't get all of it, but I get some of it. I was fortunate enough, Tracy was fortunate enough, we grew up in an intact family. My mom, and I, I, I knew this about my dad. He worked hard to provide for his family. I may not have had the, the best relationship with my dad, but I always knew where he was and what he was doing. And it was doing what he felt he needed to do to provide for his family. I know that about my dad. Did my dad fail me? Absolutely. Did I fail my dad? Absolutely. I was one of the lucky ones. God allowed me to, to grow up in an intact family where I knew I knew my mom and my dad loved me. But that was strengthened as I learned verses like John 3.16, where I could think of my heavenly father in, in a way that, that is different than my earthly father. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. That means he will never be separated from God for eternity, but have everlasting life. You see, that's my father in heaven. That's how much he loved 
the world. That's how much he loves me because why? Again, because why? Because he is, by definition, love. And we read in Romans chapter 5 where, 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 Jesus said, or where Paul says that scarcely will a man give his life for another, but God in his what? Great love while we were yet sinners sent his only son. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Verse 10. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's what I want you to know about our father. That's what I want you to believe in your heart about our father who art in heaven. Ephesians Chapter 2, we did this and we, we, we went through this deeply. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. But God, there's those words again. He made us alive because he is rich in mercy because of his great love. Say it with conviction, with which he loved us. Loved us loves us, is going to always love us. Why? Tell me why. He is, by very definition, love. It is his description. He wants to be your father. He desires to be your father. And in chapter 7, Jesus says, who gives good gifts to those who seek him. There were times when I wondered some of this stuff about my father, about my dad. I knew where he was. I knew what he was doing. But there were times that I wondered. Our father, Jesus says, when you pray, pray to your father. who wants to give you good gifts. Jesus says, when you pray, when you pray, call on dad. Our father, this morning, we call upon you to give us what we need. Father, some of us need, someone may need to come and enter into a relationship with you today. And, and, and you're calling them <clears throat> unto yourself because you desire, because of your great love, to have a relationship with us. I pray this morning they would listen and they would act and they would move toward you as Father. And God, I pray today that if we, when we pray, Jesus says, to call on Dad and to glorify His name. Stand, if you will. We'll be dismissed with the words of this song. You know them. I don't know. Oh, it, it, it's not this song. Just take this offering. It's not this song. This song is glorify thy name. Father, we love you. 
we worship and adore you. This will be our exit song this morning. Father, I love you. I worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name.